approaching the Chag of Purim always brings to mind the worst Halosh and Hora in the history of Kla Yisrael. Rovo the Amora writes in Reseches Megillah, Daf Yud Gimel Amad Beis, May Olam, no one ever said Loshon Hara Lishna Bisho, no one ever spread Loshon Hara about Kla Yisrael on a worse level than Haman and the nefarious Haman Arasha, the personification of Amalek in his time. And what was the choice Loshon Hara of Haman that Mufuzoran Heim Beina Amim, that won on Posuk in the pages of Megillas Esther Perakimel Posuches Hein Am Afuzo Mafur Bein Amim. Take a look at Hashverosh at the nation of Klai Yisrael. They are dispersed all throughout. They're Mafuzo Mafur. That is the worst lashon hara to highlight that Klai Yisrael is lacking Achdus. That they're not together as a unified cohesive group. On the contrary, I'm a fuzo, I'm a fuzo, I'm a fuzo, that gave rise to Haman and Achashverosh's animosity. That stands forever as the worst lush and horror from time immemorial. And that's when Amalek can fight Kla Yisrael. Turning back the pages, rewinding to the end of Parsis Peshalach, that momentous battle that we had with Amalek, writes the Torah Kedoshah per Kitzayin Poseches, Vayilochem im Yisrael Berefidim. The Torah made a point of highlighting where did the Mechama, where did we have to face this belligerent opponent called Amalek? Where did we do battle with them in a place called Berefidim? Writes the Kleyokar in the 1600s, writes the Chida in his Droshes Kisei David and Droshud in the 1800s, the Kleyokar, the Chida, they both say that if you slightly change the letters of that word Rafidim, it yields Paridim. Switch around the first two letters of the word and don't read it. Read it rather. They fought them. Where pre them? Loshan Amafuzur Umafurad. Tahainu when Klayasol is scattered, when they're dispersed, when they're not together as Keishachad, Balevachad. That's when there's a Pesach, an opportunity for an opponent called Amalek to wage a war against the Jewish people. When we are Paridim, when we are an Amafuzur Umafurad, Baina Amim. So what's the tikkun? The tikkun, of course, is, writes the Svasemes in a number of places in his Ha'orus and Purim. Ikar HaYeshua came when Esther recited those precious words, Leich Kenos Es Kol HaYehudim. The Yeshua, the salvation, and the ensuing Dola all transpired because of one thing. Alech kenos is kolayud and bring them all together again. Brosam yachad techeles Mordechai. Mishloch monos ish l'reyehu. Writes the Svasemes echoing an earlier Maharal in his Or Chodesh on Megillus Esther. Kimu vekiblu hayehudim vekiblu is spelled loshen yochad with the singular conjugation. Precisely to illustrate, writes the Maharal, writes the Svasemes, that they were makabel as one unified, one unit of clients all together as one, that's what engendered the ensuing Geula, that's what brought about the Achdus and the Tikkun for the Sinashinam that made us in a state of Paridim. When we get together as one, as one nation called Klayasol, which of course begins when every community could get together as a community. When you can have an evening such as this, as we start Rosh Chodesh Odr Shani, by having no fewer than 16 renowned organizations in this community and beyond here in the five towns, Rockaways and Queens, to have 16 different Choshim organizations doing Leif and Nefesh for Klai Yisrael, uniting together, coming together as one group, as one unified Ab, to be Machazik us and to provide for us crucial tips and tools for turbulent times. That's how the night begins. It begins when 16 organizations come together. When I am asked specifically, Rabbi Feiner, please do not highlight any one organization over another. So many were instrumental in putting this evening together, and we give them a tremendous yeshakayach me'oma kalev to each and every person involved, to all the wonderful organizations involved. And the beauty is, they all came together as this community, Baruch Hashem, can show we're going to start to Rosh Chodesh Adar Shani by coming together, Mitzad, our organizations coming together, Mitzad the individuals 
who comprise this beautiful and unparalleled community. And Amir Tashem, we will come together and be Mesakin with an Aftos of Alech Kenosis Kola Yehudim as the Barosam Yachat the Chaylas Mordechai as a Mishloch Monos Ish Lereyeo to be Marbe the Achva and the Reyus and to come together Kimu Vekiblu to be Makabal as one Vayichan Shami Yisol as an Ishechad Bolevechad and thus to be Makabal the Torah Mechadosh we come together as one we steig we grow and we thrive together as one and Baruch Hashem we have a wonderful lineup of speakers this evening and without further ado I pass over the program and I thank each and every one of you for coming out tonight and Amir Hashem, we will continue. Be Mamshech, this wonderful actors to give Nachas Ruach to a Kodesh Baruch Hu, to bring about to the Geula Shlema and be a Skol Tzedek. The Meir of Yamenu, Amen of Yamein. Thank you, Rabbi Feiner. I want to welcome everyone here tonight. It's amazing to come out. It's not easy on a weeknight to get out. Um, I'm amazed at how many people are here. There are so many people that worked very hard to make this night happen. There was an amazing committee that I worked with, Ruchama Klatman, Zahava Farman, Avi Feldman, Toby Goldfeder, So Goldfigur, Viva Hach, Rina Kuttner, Brucha Lowinger, Siri Schaffen and Mindy Werbowski. All of their time, all giving their input, all running to do all the little things that needed to be done to work together tonight. The, the 12 non-for-profit agencies tonight that are sponsoring this, Achiezer Amudim, Biker Cholim, Chai Lifeline, Hatzala, Madrigos, Magain, New York, Mask, New Horizon, Ohel, Project Extreme, and Tova, are all each very unique and different agencies that provide a tremendous amount of services to this community. They each have support lines, food delivery, providing counseling, financial assistance, mentoring, crisis in intervention, advocacy, We've put together a folder for each of you to take home that has all of the agency's information. Utilize us, use us. We're all here, we're all always answering phones, and there's so many amazing organizations that do so much for this community. There are also representatives for all, all the communities here tonight, and please come up to us afterwards, get our contact information, which is in the folder, and if we can do anything for you, we're all here to, for that reason tonight. An extra thank you to our other sponsors, Chazak, an amazing organization um, that provides um, education in Yiddishkeit to so many. Um, obviously, an event in the five towns is always um, many times sponsored by Gourmet Glatz for their tremendous chesed. We appreciate that. The town of Hempstead, Councilman Bruce Blackman contributed tonight, and we appreciate him coming and being here. And of course, obviously, Refiner and the White Shell is always opening their doors to community events, and we have tremendous Sakharas I told to them. And like Rabbi Feiner said, this is a tonight a, a night of Aftus coming together with all the agencies to really present to you ideas and concepts to help build ourselves up. Now comes the hard part. Um, on my way over here, I saw an email. My name was on the, if you need more information, someone reached out and said, I can't be there tonight. I'm, I, can't, I can't get there tonight. Will this be recorded? Signed, A.S., mother of a sexually abused child. That's the pain. That's what's going on. There's pain, there's suffering, there's discomfort in many different areas. We see it in our agencies. We're on the front lines. We're answering the phones. The people are coming in the doors. There's crisis. We're seeing it. We're seeing the divorce. We're seeing the effects of terrorism. We're seeing the financial strain. We're seeing the abuse. We're seeing the addiction. We're seeing the mental illness. We're seeing the depression, sometimes such, such deep depression. We're seeing the overdoses. We're all seeing it. Our agencies are seeing it on a daily basis. And there's no one that's not affected by it. And as hard as these, these ideas and these concepts are to talk about, we had to. What more could we do? That's why we came together as a committee. What more can we give the community? And so we decided to come together and bring chizuk, bring inspiration to the community, bring ideas, bring real concepts, bring a folder of real 
numbers that you could take home tonight. And so we hope you'll utilize all of our agencies. And we need to take action. We need to take action in strengthening ourselves. We need to be strong for ourselves to raise families. We need to be strong for others. We need to be strong as mental health professionals to provide services like we do. And so we wanted to balance tonight the therapeutic component and the spiritual component. And taking action means you being here. Taking action means taking steps after this, listening to tonight, taking it home. And so we brought in tonight a thera the therapeutic side, which I'm going to introduce, is someone with a lot of finesse, realization, a lot of experience dealing with the crisis, the suffering, the pain that we are seeing. I want to introduce our first speaker, Yitzi Harwitz, a licensed clinical social worker who maintains his practice in Brooklyn and Long Island. He deals with many mental health disorders, depression, anxiety, adult ADD. Yitzi treats couples. He does a lot of premarital counseling. He's done Shalom workshops. He's a trainer in Shalom workshops. He was an adjunct teacher at Wurzweiler School of Social Work. And he's an executive secretary of the board of directors of Nefesh International. What's unique about Yitzi is he brings together the mental health perspective and our everyday Yiddishkeit lives. And we knew he would be able to blend those beautifully together and be able to give over to you ideas to take home tonight. Yitzi? Thank you. Sorry, give me a second. Can you hear me? Okay, good. A few weeks ago, I had the privilege of listening to Rabbi Feiner speak at my daughter's school, Malafa Malka dinner. And he talked about the importance of starting off a speech with a milsa de bidichusa, with a joke. And I couldn't think of a joke. And to me, that was the biggest joke because usually I have something funny to say, but tonight I couldn't. So instead, let me start off with a, with a thought that I had. As Rabbi Feiner mentioned, as Rabbi Feiner mentioned, Mishinichnas Adar Marban Simcha, tonight is Rosh Adar. A few weeks ago, I had this chus of standing by the Kaisel and davening. I took a trip to Eretz Yisrael. Standing by the Kaisel, I was struck by what the Kaisel is. Right? It's essentially, it's a building, it's a, it's a wall left over from the base of Mikdash that represents, of course, the coming of Mashiach. As we know, the base of Mikdash will be rebuilt starting from the Kaisal. And on the one hand, it represents tremendous renewal, hope, new beginnings, the longing we all have for Mashiach. But of course, what it also represents is Chorban, because it's the last remaining piece of Chorban. And I was thinking about this dichotomy, Mishnech Nesad and Marvin Mesimcha were gathered here to talk about Tsar. And I think perhaps the message is as follows. When people suffer, when people are in pain, when people sitting in Shiva, people going through difficult times, it's not really a time to try to figure out what the purpose of the pain is. Pain is something that really destroys our cognitive abilities to think. So Mishinich Nasad or Marvin Basimcha, perhaps at a time of Simcha, in the context of Simcha, we can gather here tonight and talk a little bit about, perhaps, some ways of understanding and wrapping our heads around what pain is. Let me tell you a story. I like Hasidish Shemaislach, for those of you that know me. The Magad of Mizrich, who was the, the Talmud of the Baal Shem Tov, had a grandson who was known as the Rizhoner. Rabbi Yisrael of Rizhin was a very, very interesting tzaddik. He was somebody who 
lived in, with great opulence and wealth. And the story goes as follows. A chassid came to the Rishna and said, Rebbe, I'm, I'm an old man, I'm getting ready to die, I'm making a chesh ben hanefesh, and I'm thinking about what my life was. And I was going through all the years, and I realized that I never really was very comfortable in life. I don't remember a day that I went, that went by that I was ever really fulfilled with food. I don't remember a winter that went by that I was warm. My wife suffered, my children suffered, and I realized that if I could sum up my life, I would say it was probably just filled with tsaris. And I'm making a chesh ben anefesh, I'm going to come up to the best in Shemal, I'm going to come up to Shemayim, and I'm thinking, what's going to be, what am I going to talk to Hashem about? And I realized I don't have any tainas in the Rabbi Nishleilam for the tsaris that I had. But I was thinking that, you know, with all the tsaris that I had and all the difficulties that I had, I had to spend a lot of time working, I had to spend a lot of time taking care of my family, and I didn't have enough time to do really much staka, kamilas chasadim. I always wanted to learn a little bit, sit down with a nice warm coffee, maybe say some tehillim, and I never had time for that. And so I have a shtickle of a time, I have a little bit of a complaint against the Rabbi Nishal, and what's going to be with my life? I wanted to do such good things, but I couldn't because I was, my life was just filled with tsaris. Every day I came home and instead of davening or learning, I just, I fell asleep, I krechzed, I complained. Since that I have a little bit of a time on the Rabbi Nishal, and Rebbe, please tell me, you know, before, I don't want to come up to Shemayim and, and, and Kav Yochel have a, a time on the Rabbi Nishal, how do I wrap my head around this? And the Rishoner, as those of us who, who might know the personality of the Rishoner, answered him with a very, very straightforward one line. What he said as follows, he said, my chassid, who told you what is more chavav in the eyes of the Rabbi Nishalaylam? Your krechtzing, your pain, or your maizim toivim? Who told you that the Rabbi Nishalaylam wanted you to sit and learn? Maybe the Rabbi Nishalaylam wanted you to suffer. It's a hard story to think about. It's a hard answer to think about. And certainly I'm not going to talk about it hashkafically. But I think that there's something very, very important in what the Rishoner is saying. Every single one of us has some kind of suffering, have some, has some kind of pain. It's something Hashem gives us as an Esayim. Some of us have small complaints, some of us have really, really big complaints. So let's think about this for a minute. We call this tips and tools for turbulent times. Turbulence is confusion. And when I think of confusion, I think of being jolted out of my reality. Whatever I felt was certain, somehow becomes not certain anymore. The ground shakes underneath me. I'm not really sure my expectations of life. Things that I thought were real perhaps turn out not to be real. The feelings of disappointments and overwhelm are constantly growing in our lives, whether it's here, in our, in our community, in communities across the world, in Eretz Yisrael, of course. Some examples, some things that I see in my practice. People saying things like, I put my trust into someone, but I was sorely disappointed. I did business with somebody who was from, and as it turns out, well, he stole all my money and ran away. I thought that if I was good and I tried really hard, I'd be successful. I thought that only other people got cancer. I thought that only someone else's kid would get killed in Israel. I thought only somebody else would struggle with addictions. I didn't think my life would become confused with all of what's going on with internet pornography and other, other forms of sexual confusion. And yet somehow, way too many of us are living with these realities. But let's look at things on a little bit of a larger scale. I don't know how many people still listen to or watch the news. I can't watch it anymore. I mean, the news is just a magnet for negativity. Someone gets killed here, something happens over there. It's as if we've become addicted to pain somehow. Another shooting, another school massacre, another dictator somewhere has decided to kill out his entire country. Something that goes really underreported is anti-Semitism over campuses throughout the United States, through Europe, 
Of course, the stories that come out of Eretz Yisrael every day or every other day. I got a message about three hours ago that a, a mother in Lakewood was killed today in some kind of horrible car accident with the three little kids sitting in the car. I mean, these are realities. And I would love to tell you tonight how to, how to conquer pain. I would love to announce that Mashiach is sitting right outside, of course waiting for me to finish speaking, but Mashiach is sitting right outside, pack your bags, let's go, we're, gonna, we're just going to go home, we're going to go to Eretz Yisrael, we're going to build the base of Mikdash. But I haven't gotten that WhatsApp message yet. So let's take a journey a little bit. Let's see if we could define pain. Let's see whether or not we can come up with some way of walking out of here with some kind of chizuk. So I want to tell you about a research study. It's not a research study, it's actually an entire body of research. It's called the negativity bias. What researchers have shown in the field of neuroscience, biology, psychology, is that the human brain reacts to negative emotions up to five times more intensely than the human brain reacts to positive emotions. Now think about this, we can all relate to this. So let's say I wake up in the morning and I start my day on time, I show up to shul on time, I come home, I have a positive interaction with my wife and kids, I get to work on time, I have a successful day, um, I remember to call my mother and do something nice, and I also manage to get one person upset at me. At the end of the day, what's going to stick out in my mind? That one person that I got upset at, at that, that got upset at me. Because what the negativity bias essentially shows us is that we have a propensity, naturally, biologically, we have a propensity to be affected more negatively by, to be affected more powerfully by negative things. With that in mind, of course, we recognize that developmentally our goal is to learn how to overcome disappointments. The goal, our goal in life is not to get bogged down by the negativity. Let me posit three things about pain. Three facts, if you will. And this applies whether, again, we're talking about small things, big things, life-changing things, small tiny little disappointments like stubbing your toe in the middle of the night. But let's say this. Number one, let's define what pain is. If you think about what physical pain is, pain is an indicator. In fact, it's actually a gift. It's like a sign. It says there's something not right. Something's not right. Something doesn't feel right. It's a gift, it's a matana from Hashem that shows us there's something not right. And the same thing is true with emotional pain. If I have any kind of emotional pain, again, it's a simon from Shemayim that there's something not right. So that's number one. Number two, like I said before, pain is something that every single human being has. Whether it's a big scale or not a big scale, pain is something, it's an assignment from Hashem, it's something that's a fact of life. And the third fact that I want to really focus on is that there are two basically different kinds of pain that people go through. There is pain that is inflicted by internal things, whether it's depression, whether it's um, weight, whether it's anxiety, whether it's an addiction. But pain, of course, is also something that can be inflicted on us. It's a very, very sad reality. In the, in the 10 years that I'm a therapist, I can't tell you how many different stories of sexual molestation, of divorce, men and women struggling with things like homosexuality, addictions. There are lists of addictions that, that keep growing by the day. And the effects of technology, I'm not talking about pornography, I'm simply talking about how pe people get lost and, and intimacy kind of goes out the window with technology. So there are two different kind of pains. There's, there are pains that take place because of things that we struggle with personally, and there are pains that are, of course, inflicted on us. So those are three facts. Those are three basic facts about pain. Again, number one, 
Pain is an indicator that something's not right. Number two, pain is something that every single one of us has. And number three, there are two different sources of pain. There are internal sources of pain and external sources of pain. But now this is where things get complex. Because while all that is true, we of course as human beings react to pain. And in our reactions to pain, I would say that there are two basic kinds of reactions to pain. There are people who suffer and there are people who grieve. And let me tell you what the difference in my mind is. The difference between suffering and grieving is as follows. People who suffer get stuck in their pain. They get stuck feeling pain, they don't grow, they don't move on, they don't accept new realities, and essentially they end up with a cycle of pain. That's people who suffer. And again, I'm using that terminology, suffer, to describe that kind of reaction. And of course there are people who grieve. And grieving, as we'll talk about in a minute, is the opposite. Grieving allows us to deal with pain. It allows us to see what in, what's, what's being indicated. As, as I said before, pain is a gift, it's an indicator. So let's talk for a minute about suffering. People who suffer essentially believe that they can't deal with whatever's causing them pain. And in fact, we can all relate to some of these things that I'm going to say. For example, people, how many of us can relate to eating when we feel bored? Maybe I'm the only one. But I could say this, boredom is a kind of anxiety. It's, it's something discomforting. It's a source of pain. When we eat, when we're bored, we're essentially suffering. Because what we're saying is, is I'm not facing my pain. I'm going to distract myself. I'm going to do something different. How many of us can relate to working too hard when we're anxious? or keeping ourselves really, really busy and distracting ourselves when we're sad. Again, that is a form of suffering. Because what suffering essentially says is I can't deal with pain. <clears throat> but there's something a lot worse about suffering. There's something a lot worse about people who can't handle pain. When people think that pain is an indicator that they're not good. And this to me is probably the number one thing that I see in my office on a consistent hourly basis. When people assume that because there's some kind of disappointment in their life or there's some kind of pain, it means that they're not good. That the Rabbani Shalom hates them, that essentially they're just evil people, and that's the reason why they have pain. Of course, we're talking about shame. That's the word that defines this. Shame is an epidemic. It is probably the biggest epidemic that the world suffers from today. A lack of sense of self, a lack of joy, a lack of interest in life, because essentially life gets too hard, I can't deal with it, and I shut down. Like I said before, but almost on an hourly basis, shame is probably the greatest thing that I treat. And in fact, you know, the jokes, the, they make lots of jokes about psychologists and, and mental health people. I, one, one joke comes to, my, to mind right away. Forgive me, it's a, it's a joke about a bar, but I'll tell you very quickly. I guess I did have a joke. Uh, a, a guy walks into a bar and he orders a beer. Um, not that I know what a bar is, but in bars they have you know, beer and there's a bartender and the guy gives him a, a, a bottle of beer and the guy drinks half the bottle of beer and he throws the other half back in the bartender's face. I said, the bartender goes, well, what are you doing? So he says, listen, you know, I'm really, really sorry. It's been 30 years since I've been in a bar. I have this problem, and I, I don't really know much about it. I thought after 30 years I'd be over this problem. I, I, I really, I, I don't get it. I'm really, really sorry. So the bartender realizes that this guy is, you know, this is like a, a really difficult existential crisis for him. So he pulls out a business card, and he gives it to the guy, and he says, listen, my brother's a psychologist. Go see him, he'll help you. You don't have to walk around with so much shame and negativity in your whole life. Go get fixed, go get help, and come back when you're finished and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll give you a free beer and you know, you'll see, it's not, it's not the end of the world. Six months later, the door to the bar comes, you know, the door comes flying open and this guy walks in like, you know, like he owns the place and he turns to the bartender and he says, I want drinks on everybody. Your brother's a genius, the psychologist is a genius. So the bartender says, wow, that's great. And he gives, him, he gives him a bottle of beer, 
And the guy drinks half the bottle of beer, and what do you think he does? He throws the other half back in the bartender's face. So the bartender says, wait, wait one second. Six months later, you went to the psychologist. He said, everything is fine, everything's great. But you threw, the, you threw the bottle of beer back at me. So the guy says, no, no, you don't understand. I went to your brother. He helped me. I don't feel bad about it anymore. It's great. I'm cured. It's a joke. But the reality is, most of what people suffer with when they come to therapy, it's not that people have crises in life that are very different than the rest of us. It's that they don't know how to deal with it. They suffer. They get stuck in this thing called shame. It's the most toxic thing. It's the, most epidem it's the biggest epidemic, in my opinion, in the world of mental health. So that's suffering. Let's talk for a minute about grieving. Of course, as the other reaction to pain. Somebody who grieves, obviously, is able to say that I recognize that there are disappointments in my life. I recognize that, like I said, the Rabbi Nishalim gives me a and it's okay that I'm in pain. It's okay means that I recognize that the pain is going to take me somewhere. And if I allow myself time, I will heal, I will grow. If I spend time alone, if I spend time with a confidant, if I lean on somebody's shoulder, if I'm able to cry, to me, one of the most psychologically poignant halachas that we have are the halachas of Avelis. Without going into anything, again, ashkafically, I'll just say this. All of the halachas of Avelis mimic what modern psychology has shown to be the stages of grief. First, you have, you have a stage called Aninus, then you have Shiva, then you have a month, then you have a year, and then you have a yard site. I had a couple who came to me once. Their fairly young teenager had overdosed on drugs. They came to me a few weeks after the child's death, and I sent them away, and I said, you're sitting at a time now where you're going to be in pain. And there's nothing, I mean, I could listen to you, but you have each other, and you have family. You don't need to be in therapy now. Come back to me in a year if you can't budge and you can't move. And kachava, they did. They came back to me a year later, and the message that they had learned after walking out of therapy was they can't bring their son back. And the, the, the hole that's in their heart is not going anywhere. But they don't have to have their lives stopped because of it. That is what grieving looks like. People who grieve need healthy outlets. When somebody has some kind of pain inflicted on them, they need to find something that they can engage in. Not something to distract themselves, but something they can engage in. When we grieve, we need to give ourselves time. We need to, give our, we need to find what our limitations are. We need to recognize, like I said, that pain is a normal part of life. And of course, people who grieve, or when we grieve, we grieve without shame. We live in a society today, of course, especially in the firm world, that's really hard to cry in public. But crying is a natural, normal sense of, of, of grieving. And let me share with you one more idea about grieving, about clarity. Because like I said before, when people have pain, there are two kinds of sources of pain. There are things that happen to us that are inflicted on us by other, by other people. And then, of course, there are things that we struggle with in our own selves that cause us disappointment. But if, if I can, I would like to make a paradigm shift. I would like for a minute for us to stop thinking about whether or not pain is caused by other people or pain is caused by ourselves and make the paradigm shift to the following. What are things in my life that cause me pain that I need to learn to accept? And what are things that, that happen to me in life that I need to learn to change? Taking responsibility for myself and stopping to blame myself or other people. You know, one of the words, I, I tell this to a lot of my clients, one of the words that I, I wish could be eradicated from the English language is the word fault. F-A-U-L-T. See, I could spell. Um, fault. I don't know what the word fault means other than to say you did something wrong 
or I did something wrong. I'm not really sure what that means. The question is not who's at fault, the question is who needs to take what responsibility. When we can take responsibility for ourselves, then we can grow. When we can learn to accept, like that story I shared with you of, that, of those parents, when we can learn to accept the changes in reality, then we have successfully grieved. It's one of my favorite secular prayers that's been made famous by the, the world of 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, is the serenity prayer. I think about it all the time, and it goes like this. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Those three things are probably one of the biggest keys to life. The serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and of course, the wisdom to be able to tell the difference between the two. Pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. It's found in the writings of Rabbi Nachman in different ways, it's found in the, in, in the Tanya, it's found in Maral, etc., etc. To have this kind of clarity is something that's really, really important. But again, what I would say is, the people that come to see me, the people that really honor me by trusting me to help them, for the most part, they walk out of my office learning how to grieve. And for the most part, they know how to grieve on their own, but they have to learn how to stop suffering. And so there are many, many things we have in our Messiah about suffering and about pain. They're all different philosophical ideas, they're all different kinds of spiritual ideas. Bad things happen to me because Hashem wants to hear my tefillahs. Hashem wants me to change something in my life. Hashem wants to punish me. Hashem wants me to find silver linings in things. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. But the essential thing that I think we need to know before we get to any of those philosophical ideas is Hashem sends painful things to us. And Hashem recognizes, as we said in the halachas of Avelas, Hashem recognizes the nature of man, that we need time when we're in pain. So let's talk a little bit more practically, if we can. One of my favorite Kalbach songs, which of course is popularized, you know, after he died, are to the words in Amos, I go like this. Hashem. Their days are coming. And Hashem says, and I sent Ra'av, hunger, or really means longing. Lo Ra'av Lalechem, we're not longing, not, people will not be longing for bread. They won't be thirsty for water. But to hear the word of Hashem. After working with so many people in pain, I had the following thought. Hashem said there's going to be a longing, there's going to be some painful hunger that exists in the world. The pain and the hunger that exists in the world today is infinite. It's the kind of thing that us in the, in the field of mental health, the organizations that are represented here tonight can say, everybody is overwhelmed by it. The only thing that I can think of when I think of how infinite the amount of longing and pain there is in the world is to think about the only other thing that I know what infinity is, and that's Hashem. If I can have any hasaga about what infinity means, about what Ein Saif means, I think about the, the, the amount of tsaris that Klai Yisrael suffers through. So of course, practically, for us to learn how to turn to and daven to Hashem, in whatever language we can that would make it the most personal, of course, is the first practical step in terms of how we deal with pain. September 13, 2001, I found myself on a train driving into Manhattan with my father and recognizing and seeing from the Brooklyn Bridge how the, the entire skyline was dark. And even though everything was pitch back, black, you can still see the billows of smoke coming out of what used to be the World Trade Center. I'd spent two days prior to that glued to, I was going to say the television, but of course, you know, I wouldn't. 
to the television and sitting in my house in Flatbush and watching the soot fall down in our, in our, in, in our backyard, miles and miles away. On the train going into Manhattan with my father to spend the night volunteering for the Red Cross. And of course, I, we showed up there and they put us at a table with a big cross behind us and I had this question, but then I you know, forgot about it. And I spent the night giving out apples and towels. There was a rabbi who came and he dropped off a Tehillim. 10 minutes later, a different rabbi came, picked up the Tehillim. And I remember crying. And I really just remember crying. There was a guy that had it on the back of his sweatshirt, it said City Morgue. And he said that he was one of the drivers for the City Morgue. He asked me if he can turn around on the side and he vomited on the floor. He said he had never seen such carnage. But that night left a very, very important imprint on me because going to, to, that, to ground zero and being involved was something that was so cathartic because I had a place to cry. I had a place to, wrap, to try to wrap my head around the carnage and the evil of what was going on in the world. I can't think of something that's more helpful than to be able to be involved in something. I didn't catch the number of how many non-for-profits there are here, but I can guarantee you that at least for most of them, if any of us want to call up and volunteer, there's work to be done. Get involved, do something. It's nice to write a check. Of course, every organization needs money. But get involved. If you have suffered through something, if you have some kind of pain in your life, do something with it. Get involved. Ask how you can help. And finally, as a practical piece of advice, there's another Hasidah Shemaisa. Chassid came to Yitzchak Mavorka, threw himself down on the floor and said as follows, Rebbe, my 12-year-old daughter is laying in her deathbed. The doctors have written her off and said she's finished. She's going to die. I, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. I, I, I simply am at a loss for words and crying and crying. And the Rebbe looked at his chassid and said to him, listen, I'm sorry. The gates of Shemayim are closed. There's nothing we can do. I, there's, there's just nothing you can do. Finished. Koyle Suvrakim, the chassid screamed and he cried and he pleaded and he was, uh, he was manad of money. All kinds of things to try to get Reb Yitzchak Mavorka to Davin and Reb Yitzchak Mavorka said, I'm sorry, the gates of Shemayim are closed, there's nothing to do. Gave him a bracha and the chassid left. Ten minutes later, as the chassid's driving in his carriage down the road, he hears somebody calling his name and he turns around, opens up the door to his carriage and he sees Reb Yitzchak Mavork is running after him, chasing, sweating. And he says, wait, wait, Reb Yitzchak Mavork is calling out to his chassid, wait, wait. So the chassid stops and he says, Rebbe, what do you want? What, what, what? So Rebbe Yitzchak Mavorka gets into his car carriage and he says to him, you came to me and you asked me to daven and I said to you I couldn't daven. As you were crying to me, I was wondering, I was thinking whether or not if there's a way to have some kind of Yeshua and I couldn't find a way to have Yeshua. You promised me money. You promised you would change all your, all, all your negative traits. But Lomais, at the end of the day, there was nothing to do. I gave you a bracha and you left. But you know something? There's one thing I didn't do. I didn't cry with you. Can you give me a few minutes to just cry with you? There is something so powerful about being able to be there for each other. My finer talked about achdas. It's time we develop sensitivity to the pains of what other people go through. So many of us tend to go through obstacles and cry alone. Not sharing it with our spouses, not sharing it with our siblings, with our parents, with our friends. For every patient that comes into my office and says to me something like, I think I'm the only person in the world that, fill in the blank. Whatever it is, I'm the only person in the world that 
suffers from anxiety. I'm the only person in the world that's ever been sexually molested. I'm the only person in the world that's ever fill in the blank. I've seen at least five more people in the world like that. And sometimes I feel like I need to just open up a support group and, and walk around and say, listen, you know, you, you, you and you should all know that you're all suffering from the same thing and, no, and you all think that nobody else is suffering from that. How can we develop a certain sensitivity to each other's pain? Because we all have it. I promised my wife I wouldn't sing, so I won't sing. But here are the words to A.B. Roddenberg's Who Am I? Have you known the pain of sadness and the feelings that it brings? Yes, I'm sure there have been some times you've had to cry. And the loneliness is worst of all, I'm sure you will agree, for we are not so different, you and I. Yes, we live in a society where we all try to put our best foot forward, we all try to not be judgmental, we all try to figure out how to not be judgmental with each other, but that's a hard time we have. But Lamaisa, we are not so different. None of us are so different. All of our blood is red, all of us cry tears, all of us have some kind of disappointment in our life. How can we develop sensitivity to each other? I want to conclude with a little exercise. I want each and every one of us to take a minute and think about the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. Whether it's a person, whether it's a scenic view, the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. And when you have that thought, I want you to think of something else. Think of the thing you value or cherish the most. I want you to think of those two things for a minute. The most beautiful thing you've ever seen and the thing that you cherish and value the most. And when you have that thought, I want to tell you a word. I heard this many, many years ago and it, it, it left a really strong imprint on me. The Pasuk in Tehillim says, we say this in the morning, the Pasuk says, Hashem, who's called the, the healer of broken hearts, and the one who ties together the hearts of those who are depressed. That's one Pasuk. And the next Pasuk says, Mona Hashem is the one who counts the amount of stars there are. And he gives them names. And so the question is asked, what is the connection between these two Pasukim? They, they exist right next to each other. What is the connection between Hashem counting the amount of stars there are and giving each one of the stars names and Hashem being a rofei l'shvurei leiv, a healer of broken hearts. My father's chavrusa answered as follows. He said like this, Do you want to know how Hashem heals broken hearts? We know that, that Avram was told by Hashem that your children will be as numerous as the amount of stars there are in the sky. And not just does Hashem count the billions of stars that exist, but he calls each one by name. When a Jew feels what it's like to be the most valued and cherished creature of all of creation, when a Jew feels that when Hashem looks at him, he's the most beautiful sight that's ever been seen in Hashem's eyes, that's how Hashem heals broken hearts. Because no matter how much pain and no matter how much suffering that exists in the world, the beauty of who we are is infinitely greater than any of the negativity that we might suffer through, any of the negativity of the failures, the disappointments. That's how Hashem looks at us. Before we even talk about Tarimitzas, every single one of us has an Hashem on. And an Hashem is a piece of Hashem. And when Hashem looks down on the earth and He sees the Grand Canyon and He sees the Rockies and He sees sunsets and He sees all those things, He marvels at it, of course. But when He looks down at a, at a Jew, He sees something that's ten times more awesome. I talked a little bit about this thing called the negativity bias, that we all have this propensity to be able to be impacted five times more about negative things. But let me tell you, Something I heard from Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. 
In an address to students of a, of a somewhat secular seminary in Eretz Yisrael, he said as follows. He said that morning he was walking down the street in Rechavia somewhere. It was, it was before Vasikin and it was pitch black and he was marveling at how free he felt to be in a country where nobody would recognize him and nobody would talk to him. And of course, a little old Jew, he says, a French Jew comes up to him and he says to him, Rabbi, I have a question for you. So he says, yes. He says, how could it be that we have taken the most beautiful religion in the world and turned it into the most ugly thing? Judgments, negativity, shame, how could it be? So Rabbi Sachs addressing this crowd, he says as follows. He says, I said to the man, you know, it's not a good question. I want to think about it. He says, but based on that question, I want to offer a challenge to every single one of you seminary students. If you have had one fragment of beauty in your experience here in, in Israel, if you have tasted one good thing about Judaism, if you've had one good deep conversation or there's been one lesson that you've learned, take that message back with you to whatever community you come from. Take that message to your family, take that message to your friends and build your life around that. Cling hold, he says, cling hold to the fragmented beauty because this religion is a religion bigger, greater, and more lovely than we have sometimes allowed it to be. And that's the perspective of Yiddishkeit. That's what Hashem wants. Yes, of course, there's pain and suffering. But the simcha, Mishanichnas Adam Marvin the simcha, the simcha of what it feels like to be the most cherished and most beautiful creature of how Hashem looks at us is a simcha that never gets touched by the pain, no matter how difficult it is. And if we could tap into that, then maybe Hashem will listen to our tefillahs and piece by piece bring us back to the Kaisal, build the bricks of our broken hearts. We should be zaycha to dance this Purim with Mashiach and the Beis HaMikdash B'mher B'yameinu. Just a quick, quick thought, and we'll introduce Rabbi Shapiro, who joined us here from Florida tonight. So we'll fight him, we'll say a quick two thoughts. This, week's, this past week's parsha, Mr. Bishus Harafiner, Mr. Rabbi Goodman, Rabbi Silver from Adregos, and everybody else who really made this evening possible. I'm not going to talk about the actors, Rabbi Feiner mentioned it, and it is certainly very special to see how the community indeed has banded together as one. We have a Yaakov Bakude this last week, so we'll go to Yaakov first. And there's so much talk, obviously, about the Mishkan and the intricacies and every last detail of how the Mishkan's to be built. And at the center of it, so many Mepharshim and so many different people have asked the obvious question every time we're talking about B'Tzalel, who was the mastermind, the Pasuk traces his lineage and says B'Tzalel Ben Uri Ben Chur. And the obvious question that is asked by so many, why is that? Why every time we have to mention B'Tzalel's name, does it trace it back to B'Tzalel Ben Uri Ben Chur? And without giving the lengthy history and every terex that has been heard, Rabbi Moshe Feinstein had said that who was Chur? We all know. Chur had stood up to the people who were trying to build the ego. And we all know that in trying to be Makadosh Shem Shemayim, Hor was actually killed, al Kiddush Hashem, when he was trying to stop the eagle. One may ask, Zakhar of Moshe, is that possibly you can say that maybe this was all in vain? Because what happened? After Hor was killed, the eagle went on to be built. So what was it all about? And Ramesha and many others I saw answered over is that, and certainly it's appropriate for today's day and age, is that we can go ahead and be Makadosh Shem Shemayim. We can go ahead and do an act of chesed. We can go ahead and do something for somebody else. 
And not always are we going to see that immediate result. And maybe in a week, maybe in a month, and maybe years later. We saw from this Maisa with the eagle that what happened? That Saul ben Uri ben Chur was the one who went ahead and built the Mishkan, which was the atonement for the eagle. Why? And this was his grandson. Yes, it was years later. People asked me tonight, on the way here, I stopped by a shower bracha, and somebody said, what's, what's the evening about? What do you hope to accomplish? What does the community hope to accomplish? And truth be told, we don't know. But we have to do ours. And there's so much pain, as you heard, and I'm not going to go into it, and so much suffering. And we don't know what physical will come from tonight, what tool we will walk away with. But we do know that we do ours, and obviously there are a bunch of something fear to develop. We may not see it immediately, but everything we do, we plant that seed. We never know when we'll see the result. In this week's parsha, in Parshas Pekude, the famous words by Varach Osem Moshe, after the Mishkan was built, and so there was a bracha that was in order for the people that built the Mishkan. As I said a moment ago, that was a requirement for everyone to participate. And so I saw over the question is that derived from here is brought down that when the Kaihanim go up here, right where I'm standing, to Duchin, and they come down, and everyone says, Yashu Kayach, told the Kaihanim, this is where we learn it from. What's the connection? The question would be, is that these kahanim that come up here, and these people that built the Mishkan, this was a requirement. There was details down to the T of what they were supposed to do. Is a thank you in order? This is what they had to do. And the answer that I saw is a fundamental for all of life, and that is that Hakar Satov is a way of life. And Hakar Satov is an elementary. Hakar Satov is something that has to be built into the fabric of our lives. And yes, when you go into a store and you go to the cash register and you pay and you're paying for an item and the person gives it to you, why is he giving it to you? Because you paid for it. It's yours. But we still say thank you. Because we have to have our at no matter what, even if something is supposed to be coming to us. Rabbi Shapiro, the dear cousin of mine, and it's not his real yichas, travels around the world and literally People just can't get enough because he's, he gives them a chizik, he gives them inspiration like nobody else can. Don't cut me off yet, Rabbi Shapiro. And yes, he travels around the world, and yes, he's a speaker, yes, he's a maga that goes over, and that's why he's here, you'll say. But I just want to tell you, when I was asked by Mrs. Delman from Adregos, who worked so hard to put this together, to ask Rabbi Shapiro to speak, and he looked at his calendar, he'd been ruffling through the pages, it wasn't a Blackberry or a smartphone, index cards, and he said, it was hard, and you can ask him. He asked me, Baruch Per, why, why are you having this evening? And I said, people need chizik. It's been a difficult year for our community. Too many tragedies. We need someone to come here and teach us what it means to get through that. And literally, after hearing me talk for a couple of minutes, he heard, and he says, I want to come. And not because he's a speaker, and not because he wanted to sit on a cramped plane from Florida, he says, I hear, I hear what's going on. I want to go be with those people. I want to be with your people. I want to give them a chizik. So tonight, we collectively tell Rabbi Shapiro that we appreciate your serious nefesh in coming here. And we have an infinite hakar satov for you to be here. And we hope to walk away this evening with some chizik and indeed some practical, substantive tools to walk away as better people. Rabbi Shapiro. Tonight, my Aksanya, the one that's hosting me, both uh, in general and specifically in general, I'm grateful to my Aksanya 
more than a dozen organizations, more than a dozen organizations from the Farakaway, the five towns, from the Queens area, that offer services to help Klal Yisrael. I'm grateful to you for being my achsanya. And as you heard, the fact that more than a dozen organizations came together is a very big deal that shouldn't be lost on anyone. But specifically, my achsanya would be the hundreds that came out tonight. And as you just heard, hopefully to gather tips and tools to be inspired and perhaps even become better people. So to my achsanya in general, the organizations, to my host specifically, every individual in this room, I feel as if you're hosting me tonight, and for that, I have tremendous, tremendous hakaras hatayv. To be in the presence of the Moradas Shlita, I, I say, Yedidi verav chavivi, Yedid nafshi, you know what an honor that is to be able to say those words about the Moradas Shlita? It's a very big covet for me and to have just been introduced by my cousin, the only correction I would uh, make on your words. You know how much I love you, Baruch Ber. It's, uh, we're cousins, we're like brothers. The only correction I would make on your words, you said that my yichus is not the fact that I'm related to the Bender Mishpacha. Uh, to a very large degree, it is. <laughs> and so I'm grateful to my cousin slash brother, Baruch Ber, Nafshi Kshura bin for bringing me in together with all of the organizations. The word on the flyer was very specific. People are facing personal obstacles, family challenges, dark community tragedies, and calamities and devastating world events. What do we do? So I'd like to suggest four different things tonight, practically, <laughs> tangibly, pragmatically, that you could take with you, because there are people that are suffering, as we just said, both personally, within the community, and Klal Yisrael around the world. Number one, to borrow the words that we say in the Slichos, which means we say it before Rosh Hashanah and during the time between the Aseris Yimei Tshuva, it says, Hashem says, Come now, let us reason together. Let us gather together. If your sins were stained, like a deep crimson, now they're like a pearly white. Now the question's obvious. I didn't do anything yet. What do you mean? The Rebbein Neshalaylam says, Im yu chateichem kashonim kasheleg yalbinu. If your Averis were deep and stained, now they're white like a pure snow. What do you mean? I don't see, what did I do? Like, where are all those steps about the things that I need to do? Did you not hear the first few words, says Hashem? The first three words that the Rebbein Neshalaylam says, Lechu na v'nivachacha Come together and reason. Come together and listen. You mean that's the ticket? Yes, says the Rebbein Neshalaylam. Before a person could decide on tips and tools, before a person decides what they can do, the first thing to tell yourself tonight, I'll say it to myself, and I'll say it a bit louder for the hundreds to listen. Hashem says, Lechu na v'nivachacha, just come together, listen, reason together, and realize that something needs to be done. And the Rebbeinu Shalaylam says, Im yu kashonim, That, my friends, believe it or not, is step one. But people are waiting. Let me hear. The Rebbeinu Shalaylam himself said, you see, there are some people who don't get it. 
There are some people who hear news and they're oblivious. Okay, that happened to them. We know there's the famous story about the uh, taxi driver in Eretz Yisrael, non-religious taxi driver who was taking the mirror mashkiach of Katzko Levenstein. And he saw Reb Chatzko and he recounted a fabulous story how he and a number of friends a year, years earlier, none of them were religious and one night they were camping in some wilderness and in the tent in the middle of the night they woke up because they saw that a large snake, a bow constrictor, wrapped itself around the friend and was literally squeezing the friend to death. And the non-religious person who was seconds away from death remembered, I know what you do in this situation. You say, Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. And that's exactly what he did. And at that moment, the snake undid itself and slithered away and his life was saved miraculously. And he tells Reb Chatzkel, and my friend's life was changed. He went back, he became Dati, he became religious, he went to Yeshiva, and today his family is all religious. And Reb Chatzkel turned to the non-religious taxi driver and said, Nu, no? and what's with you? So he looked at Reb Chatzkel and said, No, harav lo mevin, you don't understand. The snake was around his neck, not my neck. Yes, there are plenty of people who will hear, and I'm sorry to say this. My father, Harav Mordechai Shapiro Zatzal, used to speak about it. What right does any person have to listen to a tzara and then continue the next bite of their meal? There are people who do that. No, it happened to him. It didn't happen to me. It happened in that community, not mine. It happened down the block. It's not me. It happened there, not here. The first thing I'm telling you is that clearly in Farakaway and the five towns and in Queens, you people get it. And I'm not saying that to wax poetic. Tonight's not a night of being warm and fuzzy. Tonight's the real deal. Step number one. People came together tonight to say, Lechu Navani Vaichacha, what can we do? So I'm not telling you that as the intro to my talk. That is tip number one. I didn't say it. The Rebina Shalaylam said it. If you want that your chatayim are no longer stained, but cleaned a pearly white, step number one, l'chunav v'nivaychacha. Realize you got to do something, come together and reason, and that in and of itself is a ginormous first step. Number two. There's a Mishnah in Kalim, Perik Yud Gimel, Mishnah Yud Zayin, that speaks about many animals that if you would make a vessel out of their skin, it would be tahar. In other words, it wouldn't convey impurity. There's one exception from the sea animals. You know what that is? Kelev Mayim. Kelev Mayim is a seal or a sea otter. That's the only exception. If you make something from its skin or its bones, it will give off and convey impurity. But why? It's a sea animal. So the Mishnah says, because it runs to dry land. And the commentaries say, what do you mean it runs to dry land? Like I'm from Florida, but I'm sure plenty of you know about seals and sea lions and sea dogs and sea otters. You didn't need me to tell you. They live in the sea, not on dry land. So the commentaries tell us you're right. But when they're being chased and they're under attack, they run to the dry land. In other words, when somebody wants to capture the seal, it runs to the dry land. Hence, it has a status of a dry land animal. That tells the Rosh Hashiva, Rav Gifter, Zeichet Tzadi, with Kodesh of Rocha, says, what? 99% of its life, it's in the sea, in the water. On the rare occasion that it's being chased, it goes to the dry land. So you give it the status of a dry land animal because that's where it goes when it's being chased 0.01% of the time? Yes, says Rav Gifter. Because where you go under pressure 
And how you do under pressure tells me who you are and what you aren't. No one's essence is defined by the things that are second nature. Oh, it's great that you do those things so well. But if there's second nature to you that tells me very little about you, says a personality no less than a gifter, a sea lion has a status and an appellation of a land animal. You want to know why? Ah, you'll tell me it rarely ever goes there, but when it's being chased, and when the fire is on, and when the heat is on, that's where it goes. Where you run and how you do under pressure tells me a lot about you. When we hear the uh, tsara from our neighbor down the block, from someone in a neighboring community, someone young is ill, someone young passes away, Rahman al-Litzlan, children having a hard time, when you think you can't hear a tragedy that's worse than the one before, how do you respond? How you do when a situation is easy tells me virtually nothing about you. Says Rav Gifter, your title and your essence is like the sea lion. How do you do under pressure? Do you make changes? And by the way, might I add something I said a little while ago here in the five towns, but subsequently saw the flip side of it. And this pshat is so delicious. Moshe Rabbeinu, the name says enough. There are many names that Moshe Rabbeinu could have had, and yet he's given the name Moshe. Why? I saw this brought down from the Vilna Gain. You know that there are three times that Moshe Rabbeinu couldn't um, see an image of something. It was difficult, as Rashi says. So he was shown an image by Hashem. What were those three things? The Menaira the Shkalim, and the moon, HaChaydesh. Rabbi Isai, what's the first letter of those three words? Menaira is a Mem, Shkalim is a Shin, and HaChaydesh is a Hey. Mem Shin Hey, Moshe's name. How you do in a difficult situation is your essence. Now, if it worked for Moshe Rabbeinu, what about us? And take a look, by the way, at the last letters. What's the last letter of Shkalim? Is a Mem. Hachaydesh is a Shin. And Menaira is a He. The last letters are also Moshe. Because the true sign of who you are is how you do in the beginning of a situation, the middle, and the end. Oh, the minute that I hear what happened to someone, I'm shaken to the core. How about a week later? How about two months later? Do you even remember who suffered the tzara? They do. Do you? Moshe Rabbeinu's essence, his name is Moshe for the Mem Shin He, is the first letter of Menei Rishkolem and Achaydesh in both directions. How we do when we hear news, the changes that we make, especially on those things that aren't so easy, tells me who we are. Now, if you read the write-up about tonight, one thing I noticed, it said each organization felt perhaps this is the calamity that should be discussed. This is the tragedy that's most prominent and prevalent. And all the organizations realized that there isn't any one, but all of them need to be addressed. And so following more than 12 organizations, I realized I'm not going to tell you one particular thing that I, Ephraim Elio Shapiro, and you by extension who are listening, need to change. What I can say to myself is that when events are taking a place, taking place, and as I understand speaking to my cousin and to others, very, very extraordinarily difficult in Farakaway in the five towns and Queens. Tragedy and sorrow one after another. How about Eretz Yisrael? Do you realize that the last few months people wake up a way that they've never woken up before? You know what the first question we ask each other is in the morning after Maidani? Any stabbings today? 
Now that is not the yaitse min aklal. That's become the norm since Sukkot. Yesterday there were five stabbings. Any stabbings today? We can barely imagine what it's like that that's the first question out of our mouth every morning. What about for those who live in Eretz Yisrael and live it? So I cannot tell you one particular area, but I can tell you what I told my Kehillah last week. If you do come together as we did last week, then pick something. The biggest shame would be, the biggest brachal of Atala would be, forgive me if that's too strong, is if someone came and didn't pick something. Perhaps I need to improve in Tzniyus. Perhaps I need to improve in Shmira Shabbos. Maybe I need to improve in Shmira Halashain. How about that? Maybe I need to improve in Kedushas Beis Haknesses. Top on the list, no talking during davening, and certainly not cell phones ringing off the hook. Maybe I need to improve in my shalom bias. Am I treating my spouse like the spouse deserves to be treated? And certainly, how am I doing in my limud hatayra, my connection to learning, shiurim, and revering our gedalim? All I did just now in the last 60 seconds was give you a checklist. You can take it home and decide. Kedushas Beis HaKnesses, Tzniyos, Limud HaToyra, Shalom Bayis, Shmira Shabbos, Shmira Salashayim. But pick something. Everybody needs to. And quite honestly, Rabbi Isai, if not now, then when? And just to conclude, suggestion and tip number two. I just heard this in the name of Reb Leibola Eger. What a shot. Reb Leibola Eger wonders that our most prestigious name is the name Yisrael. Now why are we called Yisrael? Because when Yaakov fought with the angel of Esau, Kisarisa, he fought. Oh, you fought, you fought. Sarisa, I'll give you the name Yisrael. Am I missing something? I think that Pasuk concludes. Ki Sarisa imalikim, ve'imanashim, batuchal. You fought. Oh yeah, listen to that last word. Batuchal, you won. Why in the world would our name be Yisrael, Ki Sarisa, because we fought? Isn't that like missing the most important thing? Shouldn't our name be Yitochel? I know you say it sounds funny. It wouldn't if that would be our name. Then Yisrael would sound funny. People, listen to me. The last word of the Pasuk is Batucha, we won. Shouldn't my name be Yitochel? We are B'nai Yitochel, we won. You call me Yisrael because I fought, not Yitochel because I won? Says Reb Leibola A, your shot that pierces the heart. Nowhere does it say that a Jew's job is to win. Your job is to fight. Your job is to try. Your job is to rise up to the challenge and to see how good you can do. Whether you win or not, whether you're successful or not, you don't decide, God decides. You are not called Yitochel because winning is not our end all be all. That's not a Yiddish concept. You're called Yisrael Kisarisa. You fought, you persevered, you tried, you made an effort. Whether you're successful or not, the Rebbein Shalom will decide, but just try. So my humble tip and tool for turbulent times number two is pick something from our short checklist. But chaval, if a person doesn't pick something, and as we said a moment ago, don't pick the thing that's second nature to you and easy. That's not what gave Moshe the name Moshe. As we said, the first and last letter spell Menoyer Shkolom and Achaydesh. And as Rav Gifter said, what defines your S is like the seal and sea lion is how you do under pressure. Number one, we've come together to reason. And the Rebbeinu Shalom says to the five towns, communities, you people got it. Because unfortunately, many don't. 
many say, that was him, not me. See, that happened in a different zip code, not mine. Suggestion number two, pick something and work on it. Work on it for the neighbor down the block who suffered a tragedy, an illness, a death, a child they're having a hard time with. You owe it to them. Suggestion number three. How apropos tonight is Rosh Chodesh Adar Beis. That means in two weeks we have the privilege of celebrating Purim. May we celebrate it in Yerushalayim this year. That's a convenient time to say Amen. Haman is described as Tzoyrer HaYehudim. Now literally Tzoyrer HaYehudim means the antagonist, the nemesis of the Jews. There's a shot that I saw a number of people bring down, and in my opinion, this is Mamish a keeper. Yes, Tzaira HaYehudim means he's our antagonist. You know what else it means? The word Tzaira is from the word Litzror. Litzror means to bundle together. When a Haman rises up against us, Tzaira HaYehudim! We come together and we must unite. Haman didn't exist just then. Today the name has changed, but it's still there. And yes, Nebuch, as we said here and in other places, there have been unspeakable tragedies. You know what the Rebbeinah Shalom says when those things happen? Here's tip number three. Tzoyrer ha-Yehudim. You have to gather together. Let me tell you a little secret. Nobody can do it on their own. And if they tell you they can, translate it that they're screaming for help. The Blushever Rebbe went through the, a number of camps. And the Blushever Rebbe in one of the camps, the Nazis, Yomach Shimon B'Zichron, said, dig a very deep pit, large pit, maybe 20, 30 feet, and jump across it. And if you don't, then you'll take a bullet and die in the pit. Now, who in the world could make it across such a humongous pit? A friend said to the blush of a Rebbe, Rebbe, they're making a joke out of us. No one can jump a 20, 30 foot pit. Let's go to the edge of the pit and take a bullet and let them end our lives. And the blush of a Rebbe turned to his friend and said, if the Rebbeinu Shalaylam says we must jump, then jump we will. And if we don't make it, as I said a moment ago, Kisarisa, we must try. If we're not successful, then there end all life there. But try, we must. They walk to the edge of the pit, and the blush of a Rebbe says, I'm going to count to three, close your eyes, and jump. One, two, three, jump! They open up their eyes, and miraculously, they're on the other side of the pit. The friend yells, blush of a Rebbe, we did it, we're alive, how did we do it? Rebbe, how did you make it to this side of the pit? And he says, I closed my eyes and I held on to the coattails of my Zayda and my Elta Zayda. I held on to their coattails and holding on to their coattails, I made it across. He turns to his friend and said, but you, how'd you make it across? And he says, Blush of a Rebbe, I held on to your coattails and that's how I'm here. Now let me tell you something I told my Kehillah. Now's the time to hold on to people's coattails. If more than a dozen community organizations came together that offer their services, it's because they're telling you, hold on to each other's coattails. Don't let anybody tell you that I could make it through something on my own. It ain't true. The Blush of a Reb is telling us that tip and tool number three is Sayyidah HaYehudim, you got to do it together. Leave here tonight and tell somebody, not somebody that it's easy to say it to. Saying it to somebody who is exactly like you, you come from my shtetl, we have the same milieu, we daven in the same shul, in fact our havara is the same. That's not uniting, that's cloning. Sayyidah HaYehudim. 
I need to hold on to your coattails, you get it? And you need to hold on to mine. On our own, we don't have the ability to do it. If you would like, just for perhaps 90 seconds, one of the most stunning gematrias you can ever hear in your sojourn in this world that ties tool number three together. We know that we were given 613 mitzvahs. Two were given straight by the Rebbein Nishalaylam. 611 Moshe Rabbeinu gave us. Can I ask you something of the 611, if you lived on an island by yourself in a city all alone, how many of the 611 could you do on your own? How many do you think you could do on your own of the 611? You know what the answer is? 60. I think 60 is about 10% of 611. I mean, getting a 10 on the test is pretty bad. I think the only one who does worse is the TSA. I think last time they were checked, 70 bombs, 67 made it through undetected. Hine lo yonim velo yish on shaymer Yisrael, huh? The Rebbeinah Shalaylam is protecting the world. Of the 611, I can only do 60. How many does that mean I need you for? 551. The remaining amount. I need the Kayanim, I need the Levium, I need the Yisraelim, I need the women, I need children, I need to live in Eretz Yisrael. For 551, I can't do it without holding on to your coattails. Every morning in Shachris we say, Listen to a Chsam Seifer that's brought down in the Drushas by Simchas Taira. Taira is spelled Tavav Reish He. Tavav Reish He as the Gematria. 611. Taira! 611 mitzvahs? Tziva lanu Moshe. Moshe Rabbeinu gave us. Mairasha! How do you spell the word Mairasha? Memvav, Reish, Shin, Hey. It has the exact gematria of 551. Mairasha! For 551 mitzvahs? Kehilas, Yaakov! You gotta be a kehila. Because on your own, you could do 60. And nobody wants to get a 10 on the test. Torah tziva lanu Moshe. But my Russia, for 551, kehilas Yaakov. Tip number three, hold on to each other's coattails. And don't let go. I'd like to just conclude tip number three with a story that happened a number of years ago involving a younger man in the Mir, New York. This younger man was a Kleisenberger chassid. His hasmada was off the charts. When he started to miss Seder, they realized he's ill. He was diagnosed. The yeshiva was devastated. He was particularly close to Reblazer Ginsburg. Reblazer Ginsburg would visit him from time to time. Please, I'm asking the men and women, like, open your heart to this Misa. Reblazer Ginsburg went to visit this Kleisenberger Chassid. He was critically ill in the hospital. In fact, after the visit, he died two days later. You hear how ill he was? He died 48 hours later. Reb Lezer Ginsburg walks into the Kleisenberger Chassan and the Kleisenberger Chassan says to him, Rebbe, you know there's an older girl. I was thinking about this and this person for a shidduch. What do you think? And Reb Lezer Ginsburg says, what? You're going through what you're going through? And you have on your mind a shidduch for an older, older girl? How do you do that? You're going through what you're going through. You're thinking, how do you do that? So he answered based on a Gemara and Brachis Dav Yud on the bottom. You'll hear this shot once in your life, I assure you, you'll never forget it. The Gemara says, Even if there's a sharp sword on the edge of your neck, Don't stop asking Hashem for Rachamim. Now that, my friends, was the literal translation. I'll say it again. 
even if there's a sharp sword at the edge of your neck, don't stop asking Hashem for forgiveness. Don't stop asking Hashem to have compassion on you. He turns to Blazer Ginsburg and says, Rebbe, you want to know how I could think about that girl? Mind you, it was two days before he died. Because I read the Gemara differently. Maybe Hashem is saying, Even if a person has a sword at the edge of his neck, meaning he's going through a tragedy and a calamity, it doesn't absolve them from showing rachamim to another person. He told his Rebbe, nowhere does it say that because I'm going through what I'm going through, I'm absolved and I'm off the hook from helping another Yid. And that's how I could have her on my mind two days early, two days before he died. We're not absolved from helping someone else. So to conclude suggestion number three, for 90% success in life, we need each other. Hold on to coattails and never let go. You know what it means to the person when you call them or visit them or something as small as a nice comment months later? I had mentioned to my dear cousin uh, a little while ago, we spoke that the reason that Choyshech was the worst plague of all, because people were alone. And when you go through something alone, it's the most miserable feeling. And I'd like to tell you one thing before we go on to the fourth and final one. I was just in a particular city. I'm not going to say the city. And on a Matzik Shabbos gathering, I said this pshat. And we said it strongly with passion. And a certain person came over to you. I'm obviously not going to mention the name or get very specific. But he starts to tell me, I want you to know something. My life is, and he fills in all the things going wrong in his life. And it was a long list. And I thought he was going to say to me, you know, it was hard to hear that pshat about al yimno yatsman arachamim when I'm going through what I'm going through. I was sure he was going to say that. And honest to goodness, he turns to me and said, I'm so happy you said that pshat. Because I was always feeling sorry for myself. And I was always feeling like, look at all the things that are going wrong. But tonight you're telling me, al yimno yatsman arachamim. It doesn't absolve you from turning to someone else and saying, I am there for you. He said, thank you, you changed my life. He literally told me how despondent he was. He lived with angst because he felt if life is so bad, what is his worth? You know what his worth is? Al yimna yatsum in arachlim, help somebody else. That's suggestion number three. As a tzibur, hold on to coattails. And when you hear somebody's going through something, even if you're not having a day that's all that. Make sure you do something for them. And finally, number four. Perhaps the best way to introduce the last tip for turbulent times. I can't say it. The Chusteruv said it. Wow. It was the dark days of the Holocaust. The Nazis were marching into Chust. It was before Pesach. They gathered underground to get ready for Pesach and the Hasidim turned and said to the Chusteruv Rebbe, the Nazis are marching in. What can you tell us before Pesach to give us chizuk? They essentially asked, give us tips and tools for turbulent times. That's what they asked. And he said, I'll tell you the answer. Here is the ticket. In the Halach Ma'anya before Manashtana, it says, Hashata Hacha, now you're here. Lashana Haba, be Yerushalayim. Be'ezus Hashem, you're about to go to Yerushalayim. The Chuster asked his Hasidim, why in the world is the Haggadah telling me, Hashata Hacha, I'm here. I need the Haggadah to tell me where I am. I know now I'm in the White Shul. I know when I'm in North Miami Beach. It's like we used to go to a mall and there would be a little star, you are here. I need the Baal Haggadah to tell me that I'm here. Hoshata Hacha. Said the Chuster Rebbe, that's not what it's saying. It means Hoshata Hacha. 
now we are still here. And if we are still here after inquisitions and expulsions and a Tachmetach and a Holocaust, if we are still here, said the Chuster Rebbe, then you can believe Lashon Habab Yerushalayim, but you gotta believe. Hashata Hacha, we are still here. You know it's inexplicable. It doesn't make any sense. Mathematically, the permutations and computations, we shouldn't be here. Could you please explain to me how we seem to bounce back with a resiliency stronger and better? Can you explain it? The Chuster Rebbe told us Hasidim, and it's the same thing tonight here when you gather in the five towns. Hoshata Hocha. The people who suffer from a personal tragedy, Rahman a communal tragedy, a world and global tragedy. They still tell the Rebbeinu Hashata Hacha, we are still here. And if you're still here, then Lashana Habab Yerushalayim. I believe, I'm a Maimon, I will daven, I will persevere, I'll have an inexplicable resiliency, and I'll see you in Yerushalayim. My father's buried in Eretz Yisrael. Every year I go to his cave or on his yard site. A year and a half ago when I went, it was a Tuesday in November. By the time I landed, the world was changed forever. It was the Tuesday of the Harnof Massacre. Parenthetically, to the one who says, like, is seven, eight minutes such a big deal? Yeah, the world was changed in seven minutes on that Tuesday morning. There's a world pre Harnof Massacre and post Harnof Massacre. In fact, my entire speaking schedule was changed while I was still in the air simply because schools and seminaries wanted chizuk. You know what Klal Yisrael went through and they were still there? The next night there was something in Ulam Beis Yisrael, they expected a few hundred women. When it reached 1,200 women, they had to lock the door. The next night, Thousands listened on Benais Melachim inspired by wire. You know why? Because people wanted to hold on to each other's coattails. We're still here. I was given a tour of the shul. I was with Rabbi Rubin. I went up and down the street to the four families, Yesaimim, Almanais, four Almanais, more than 20 Yesaimim. You know what? If you were there, you don't need to hear a word from me. And if you weren't there, then there's nothing I could say that will explain it. But one thing I can tell you. A bit after the massacre in that shul, there was a bris. The secular media went over to the grandfather of the baby and said, how could you make a bris in this shul? Just now it flowed with blood, blood was flowing on the floor, and now your grandson has a bris in the shul, how could you as a grandfather? And he turns to the secular media and he says, I'll answer your question. During the World War, Second World War, Rebellio Mayor Bloch, the tells of Rosh Hashiva, Rebellio Mayor Bloch was in America raising funds, and then it happened. His wife? His children, his Talmidim, his yeshiva, tells the litta, gone. They came to tell it to me, he was in the middle of writing Torah. Instead of breaking down and sobbing uncontrollably, he finished writing a very well-known shtickle. And in the shtickle he explained, people may wonder why I didn't sob uncontrollably when I heard, I don't have a wife, I don't have children, I don't have Talmidim, I don't have a yeshiva, there's no more tells the litta. He says, I'll tell you why, because that's what they want. They want that one should stop, and they want to break us. We will bounce back, we will persevere, we will have an inexplicable resiliency, and that's why I'm continuing to write this shtickle Torah without interruption. When he finished writing it, when Rebel Yomer Bloch finished writing it, he broke down crying. The grandfather of the boy turned to the secular media and said, you want to know how my grandson could have his bris in the shul? I'm the grandfather from one side. 
the great grandfather from the other side, the boy's great grandfather from the other side, you know who he is? Rebellio Meir Blach. You know what we just named my Enochle at this bris? Elio Meir, after the Elta Zeda. You people still have any questions? You could make a bris in the shul because of have a resiliency. Hashata hacha. We are still here. We're maminim. And a great grandson of Rebel Mayor Bloch could be in that shul with that name after the Zayda who said, We shall continue. Suggestion number one something needed to be done. Yashakoyach to this entire magnificent kehilla for Lachuna Venivachacha. Suggestion number two, pick something from the list, something that's a bit hard for you, and Yisrael, not Vatuchal, Yisrael, try. But don't let it be a brachal of Atala without picking anything. Suggestion number three, hold on to each other's coattails. For the one who suffered the personal tragedy, the communal calamity, the global tzara, hold on to coattails. You're not absolved from helping another person. And suggestion number four, we are still here. We forge on. We are still here. We have the ability to have a grandson named Elio Mayor after the Tells of Rosh Hashiva because he said they will not break us. You can't explain it, but one thing you could hope. L'shana habab Yerushalayim. I want to conclude with one story and one bracha, and that's it. Perhaps the story that best describes tonight, tips and tools for turbulent times, is a well-known story that happened in Auschwitz. This past summer, when I was privileged to lead a tour, and I was in Auschwitz, I said over this well-known story. A few years after the war in Eretz Yisrael, posters went up that a man was making a seum on Mayer Katan, a relatively small mesechta, yet he was making a gala seum. They didn't even know that he particularly knew how to learn. Learning was so difficult for him. You're making a suda and a seum like a wedding? It wasn't that you finished shas. It's a relatively small mesechta. Mayid Katan. He makes the siyum on the last few lines. The words of Aramaic come very difficult to him. He says the Kaddish and then they surround him. What was with that? Clearly the words are very difficult for you. You weren't so familiar with them. Mayid Katan's a small mesechta. Why did you make on Mayid Katan such a siyum like it would be a wedding? And he said, I went through Auschwitz and I lost my family. People walked around Auschwitz mumbling to themselves. Some unfortunately lost their mind, went delirious. On top of me in the bunk, on the bed, slept a man who also mumbled to himself. One night I hear that he's sobbing. I asked him why he's sobbing and he said, I also lost my family like you. And I know you see me mumbling a lot and you probably think that I have lost my mind and I'm just mumbling. My friend, that's not the case. I was privileged in my youth to learn Gemara. I knew Masechta's Baal Peh. When you see me mumbling, I am saying Gemara word by word, line by line, daft by daft, perik by perik, Masechta by Masechta, Baal Peh. I'll tell you why I'm crying. I'm up to Mayed Katan, Daf Tes. And tonight I'm leaving this world. And I'm leaving this world, and I didn't finish Mayed Katan. I'm leaving this world with an unfinished Masechta. I tried to tell the man, you're not leaving this world, don't speak like that. And he said, I am, believe me, tonight's my last night. And then he made me tell him I would finish Mayed Katan, and I said, I'll try. And then he said, no, don't try. Promise me you'll finish Mayed Katan. Promise me you'll finish my Masechta. And I looked at him and I said to him, I will. 
I promise I'll finish your Masechta for you. With that reassurance, the man closed his eyes, said Shema, and died. I was never much of a learner. Gemara was difficult for me. For the last few years, I started on Daftes in Mayit Katan, and I finished his Masechta. Tonight, I finished Mayit Katan with the promise that I made to the man whose Mayit Katan was unfinished. And that well-known story made me think, how many people left this world with Mayit Katan unfinished? And I don't mean specifically the Masechta. How many people and families who went through a tzara or a calamity, Rahman al who lost somebody, how many of those people were in the middle of their Masechtas Mayat Katan? Who's going to finish it for them? Who's going to finish it for them? Who's going to finish Mayat Katan for six million Jews? Who's going to finish Mayat Katan for all those in Eretz Yisrael who have been stabbed or have been murdered? For all those who are suffering tragedies locally and communally? Who's finishing Mayat Katan for them? Let's finish their Masechta. Let's finish their Masechta. We're not going to finish it tonight. Tonight we'll start to finish their Masechta. And I hope that those four tips are things that will make turbulent times into terrific times. I want to end with a bracha. Perhaps like one we've never heard before. The Shpol Yezeda. Turn to the Rebbeinah Shalalem. You know the Shpal Yezeda? He turned to the Rebbeinah Shalalem and said, Rebbeinah Shalalem, there's a mitzvah in your Torah that says, send away the mother bird and take the children. Shaleach tishalach esoeim veshabonim tikach loch. Send away the mother, take the children. It's a mitzvah shiluach hakan. The Shpal Yezeda like this turned to the Rebbeinah Shalalem and said, every time we've been redeemed from a galos, the two people who did it, one had a name that started with an Aleph and one with a Mem. We left Mitzrayim because of Aaron and Moshe, Aleph and Mem. We left the Purim story because of Aleph and Mem, Esther and Mordechai. And we will be redeemed because of Aleph and Mem, Eliyahu and Mashiach. Aleph and Mem always brings us from Geula to Galus. Aleph and Mem spells the word Aim. Says the Shpol Yezeda, Shaleach Teshalach Esho Aim. Send the final aim, the final Aleph Mem, Elio and Mashiach, Vesabonim Tikach Loch, and then take your children, Al Kanfei Nisharim, to Eretz Yisrael. May it be the will of the Rebbeinu Shalaylam that tonight we felt there are tips and tools that are practical and tangible. May turbulent times be turned into terrific times. May we ask the Rebbeinu Shalaylam Shaleach Teshalach Es Ha'eim Send the final aim El Yom Mashiach Vesabonim Tikach Loch We are ready so that no longer will we have to wake up in the morning and say any stabbings today? But let's wake up in the morning and say did you hear? They're dancing B'chutzes Yerushalayim it's true. Mashiach's here. The third base Hamigdash. It happened. Bimheira and Biyamenu. Amen.